And we'll move on to D-Day, the 6th of June. And what can I really give as an overview here that hasn't already been said thousands upon thousands of times before? My intention is to tell the story of a single fighter wing, so I'm going to let them tell their story in their own words. And 441 Squadron records, D-Day, on four occasions during the day, 12 of our aircraft acted as low cover over the eastern assault area. On one sortie, there was a very heavy flak, and one of our aircraft piloted by Pilot Officer Wilson was struck several times, piercing the oil line and causing the engine to seize. The pilot crash-landed at base and fortunately was uninjured. 442 Squadron writes, D-Day, light rain at 0630, but bright soon after. Flight commanders wake their crews at 0315, and Squadron Leader Russell led the squadron at 0630 over the beachhead. Great activity on the beach, few enemy aircraft, little flak, but rockets whizzing near them. Back at 0825, at 1000, listen to a radio message from General Eisenhower, and at 1025, the BBC described the scene in the RCAF briefing room, a Nissen hut, when the wing commander told the pilots last night that Tuesday was D-Day, the wing 144 not identified, but described as the youngest squadron. And this is the same BBC report that I showed the transcript of yesterday, and I'll flash it by here again. The second sortie was at 11.25 when 14 set out for the French coast, returning at 13.20 without having fired their guns. Chased a couple of Falk Wolf 190s but couldn't catch them. The squadron was on immediate readiness from 14.30. The OC led them for the third time today at 15.35, returning 17.30, still uneventful, reporting lots of shipping activity in the channel and barges beached by the tide on the French coast. King George was on the radio at 2100 hours. Two gliders landed on this airfield on their way to France, 17 men with commando equipment in each. Wing Commander Johnson led the 4th Landing Strip Patrol going over at 1945, returning at 2155, the 4th sortie for the day for the OC and Flight Commander Kilty. No enemy aircraft, tank battles visible, and all amazed at the large number of gliders landing. Total flying time, 94 hours, compared to the 20 or so hours we've been seeing on the days leading up to this. Now, 443 reports much the same. D-Day, weather cool at 8 tenths cloud at 3 to 5,000 feet. Squadron on readiness from 0430 hours and took part in the beachhead low cover patrols during the day. The first patrol was in the British area of the beachhead on the left flank, 10 miles from Le Havre. Landing operations have taken place from this point as far west as the Cherbourg Peninsula. The remaining patrols were along the strip of beach attacked by the British forces and on which they now seem established. The area of patrol extended 5 miles inland and 15 miles out to sea. 8 tenths cloud conditions prevailed throughout the day as low as 2,000 feet. The posting notice was received today for another fitter armorer to fill the newly created establishment vacancy. A telephone request for cancellation was made to records office as no extra personnel can be taken in the airlift party when the squadron moves and the main party is now in the concentration area. It has been impossible to arrange any incoming private mail facilities, and the field post office advises that all squadron mail is being sent to number 144 wing in the concentration area. We will therefore receive no mail until meeting our parent wing in France. At 10.25 hours, the BBC broadcast a portrayal of what had taken place in the wing briefing room last night when pilots were being told of the D-Day operations. In actual fact, this was our own briefing at which Wing Commander J.E. Johnson gave everyone the big news. So we have four patrols, wing-sized patrols, with all three squadrons flying as a formation led by the wing commander, Johnny Johnson, over the eastern assault area, the British and Canadian forces being covered, and of course Omaha Beach to the west and Utah Beach further to the west on the peninsula. Don't enter into the story here, those will be for another day. And we're going to pick up the first mission, it's a 0625 takeoff, and that would have put them over the beach at about 0700. Just as the first of the landing craft were starting to make their way towards the beach, 0730 or thereabouts is when the first landing took place in the British sector. Now the wing commander in his book Wing Leader gives an account here. He says that from the pilot's viewpoint, flying conditions were quite reasonable, better than we expected after the gloomy forecast from the previous two or three days. Amongst the massive shipping below us was a fighter direction ship. I called the RAF controller on my radio and asked if he had any plots of enemy formations on his table. The controller came back with a guarded reply that for the moment he had no positive information for us. We swept parallel to the coast beneath a leaden gray sky and I positioned the wing two or three hundred yards offshore so that we would not present easy targets for enemy gunners. Now 441 provides a simple description. I'll skip to 442. 
Five enemy flagships engaging aircraft from one mile off of Hav seen to enter the harbor at approximately 0730. Eastern assault meeting heavy opposition. Corsell Sumer in flames from blind bombing. No enemy aircraft opposition. Flak intense light from five flagships off Lahav. Ten tenths cloud at 5,000 feet. Five tenths from three to 1,000 feet. And from 443, aircraft dispatched to patrol east flank of the eastern or British area of the beachhead between Cherbourg Peninsula and La Hava. Squadron patrol penetration 5 miles inland and extended 15 miles to peninsula in a line 10 miles west of La Hava. No enemy aircraft encountered. Five flagships in the harbor throwing up intense accurate flak but no damage done. Eastern assault meeting heavy opposition and again Corsell Sir Mare in flames from blind bombing. Shells from the Allied warships and return from enemy batteries were reported by pilots passing close to aircraft. So on the map I have two courses plotted, one, the larger one matching the description by the wing commander, staying slightly offshore as far west as Port Embesson, that's the line dividing the British and the US sector, and then I have a smaller one that matches the 443 squadrons description of the patrol, and it's clear that they would have stuck to a little bit of both, offshore probably initially and then later in the day, pushing inwards, and we're going to see a lot of descriptions of activity around Khan that makes it very clear that they did not stay off the coast on all four missions. So we had the description of Flak off Lahav, and then Corsel Sumer in flames. And this would have also been about the time that some torpedo boats, sortie from Lahav, German boats, and engaged part of the British force that was providing a naval bombardment of defensive positions along the coast. And those German ships were driven back into the harbor like it says here at 0730. Now for the description of Corsell Sermer in flames, I do have some overhead imagery that shows exactly what that looked like there. This is Juno Beach. This is the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division coming ashore. This photo is a little bit later than this first mission since you can see the landing craft and people mustering on the beaches and starting to make their way inward. And in fact, I have another photo that's going to show exactly what the pilots on these patrols would have been seeing from a uh, low altitude like this, this is precisely what they would have seen if not on this first mission, then on later patrols in the day we have the flames and damage on the town itself as a result of bombing missions carried out that night and early in the morning to hit defensive positions and we can see actually right here some pillboxes uh, German defensive positions here along the coast, that was the target. A lot of the bombing did fall a little bit long due to the weather and wasn't nearly as effective as would have been hoped when it came to silencing some of these positions. So there was plenty of work for those ships offshore to do and for fighter bombers to do later in the day when it came to suppressing the German response. And we can see one of the exit points from Juno Beach right here with the landing craft and personnel and even vehicles starting to work their way inland. Now also at this time, troops would have been coming ashore at Sword Beach. This would be the British 3rd Infantry Division, we can see the craft coming ashore, bringing the personnel in, and this is later in the day, obviously, and we can see vehicles and personnel starting to move in and starting to secure the beachhead and defend the area. In addition, further down the coast, we have Gold Beach, and this is the site of the British 50th Infantry Division coming ashore. And in this photo, we can see a smoke screen laid down. This was intentional to provide cover to these folks as they... Landed, landing craft coming in, and personnel mustering on the beach. And again, this is a good example of exactly the view that this squadron would have had all up and down the coast and further inland as this day wears on. But for now, let's go ahead and move on to the description of the second mission. And 441 records that Pilot Officer Wilson's aircraft was badly damaged by flak, causing the engine to seize just over the English coast. The aircraft was Cat E, or a total write-off, but the pilot was uninjured. Now, 442 reports much MET on the coast roads, vehicles, as we saw in some of these photos. Trucks seen in as far as Bayo. Two Falcon Wolf 190 sighted but could not close. Flak moderate, heavy, accurate from Con. Weather clearing over beachhead, visibility good. Now, we have the mention of the Falcon Wolf 190s right here, and the wings providing cover would not have pursued enemy aircraft off of their cover location. The entire point was to keep the troops on the beach from being strafed and keep these ships in the channel from being attacked, and there were efforts made by the Germans to draw that fighter cover away so that they could go in and have some chance of doing some ground attacks. So while there was German activity over the beaches and over the channel, it's extremely rare on this day to see them 
engaged. And the fighter cover stayed in position, as was the plan, and did their job. There was no serious threat posed by the Luftwaffe on this day. And then 443, aircraft took off to cover French coastline from Point and Besson to the mouth of the Seine Estuary. So, no enemy aircraft encountered, nor any flak thrown up at squadron. Ground forces seem to be making very steady progress inland and in silencing remaining shore batteries. Weather clearing over beachhead, eight tenths cloud at 5,000 feet, three fifths inland, visibility good. So the wing would have returned, landed around 1320, 1330, and then the third mission, really nothing further to report from 441 Squadron, 442, 1540 takeoff to 1730 for a landing. Very large column, AFV, Armored Fighting Vehicles, moving west, Lisso, Con, heading, Uniform 0767, or uh, down here in this area. These are reinforcements starting to come in from the Germans, but more on that a little bit later. No enemy aircraft opposition, Flak, moderate, heavy, inaccurate, Con, moderate, inaccurate, light from column AFVs, weather clear, visibility good, 10 miles inland. 443 reports much the same. Aircraft took off to cover same area as 1125 patrol. Still no enemy aircraft and flak batteries ceased to operate. Movements forward of enemy mobile reinforcements were noted over con and reported to control center. Aircraft flown by flight officer Bentley had wing pierced by light shell but damaged very light and quickly repaired. So we see here the location called out as that column makes their way along the road west from Lesseau, 1630 and... We'll have a look at the overall German response. Now, at the time of the landing, 21st Panzer Division was already in the area, and they immediately start to move in. We also have, further to the east, 12th SS Panzer Division, and then Panzer Lair Division. Very, very formidable German divisions. These two were being held in reserve until later in the day. They were finally released to enter the area at 1600, and this column making their way into the area from Lesseau would have been, and I've confirmed it in some other accounts, leading elements of 12th SS Panzer as they come in and start to shore up the defenses of Khan. So as you can see, with 21st Panzer already there in Khan, they move in and keep the British on the right and the Canadians on the left, as is displayed on this map, from linking up, and also keep Khan from falling from a direct assault straight off the beaches. So... That's how things stand at this point. Let's go to the last mission of the day. This is a 1940 to 2150. One more fighter cover. 442 reports gliders landing at uniform 0774 and 1375 being fired on from all sides. And these are the exact locations. We'll look at these in more detail in just a second. 30 to 40 tanks in a field west of Khan. 10 Allied tanks engaging approximately 15 enemy tanks. No enemy aircraft opposition. Light and accurate flak from this general area. Weather clear, visibility good over the beach and 15 miles inland. So the weather has improved significantly since the landings themselves earlier in the day at this point 12 hours ago. 443 reports much the same. Aircraft took off to do patrol as low cover over the eastern beachhead. Still no enemy aircraft and flak batteries not operating. Gliders observed landing. Tanks observed in a field. 10 allied tanks engaging 15 enemy tanks. Over beachhead visibility good, 5 tenths cloud of 5,000 feet, 15 miles inland. So the first report we had on this mission were of gliders landing at this precise location in the field. These would have been reinforcements coming in, 6th Airborne, British Airborne Division, with additional personnel, equipment, supplies, and then another report of gliders landing up here slightly to the north and to the east of that location. Now in looking for these, I did go through a large amount of overhead imagery and I'll bring some of it up right now. This would have been, if we come down here to this location, this set would have been from before gliders started to land up here. And again, those would have been reinforcements because the 6th had already landed a large number of gliders in this area and dropped a number of personnel by parachute, securing Pegasus Bridge and making sure that this is available for forces coming inland. And even though we can't see the exact gliders that were called out, if I bring up some imagery with a little less cloud cover, we can come in here and start to see exactly what would have been seen from the air. And you can see examples of the gliders right here and the scratches made in the terrain as they came in. And, and I mentioned the paratroopers and we have some examples as we look around the terrain of the parachutes that would have been abandoned as part of that first landing. And then some like this, these look like resupply containers that would have been dropped later in the day. So 
you can at least get something of a feel for what this area would have looked like and what they would have been seeing from the air during this exact mission. Now we also had reports of 30 to 40 tanks in the field. This is down here by Carpe K Airfield. And this is the precise location that was called out in the description as far as coordinates and nothing is visible. The timing just wasn't right on this particular photo. But this certainly would have been more armor as part of the 21st Panzer Division. You can see here that at this time would have been mounting some counterattacks and trying to throw the British and the Canadians back into the sea. And that brings us to our next call out. That was 10 Allied tanks engaging 15 enemy tanks in a field right here. And that's a good example right there, seen from the air of a clash between 21st Panzer and British forces coming ashore. And the Spitfires on this mission don't engage ground forces. Again, their only job was to keep the enemy fighters from being able to come in and attack the troops on the beach. And with that, the last of the aircraft for the wing lands at... Around 2200 that night, four missions total, many of the pilots flying all four missions. That would have been a long, long day. And there is even more to come over the next few days, continuing to provide air cover for these landings as they develop. So we're going to pick the story up there on the 7th of June, D plus one. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.